All right. So for today's lecture, uh, there there were two. There was a pre lecture. Uh, there was like a mini lecture and a pre lecture that uh, you were also were, were supposed to go through, and that helped trying to create the foundation for what we're going to talk about today. That on which we're going to build upon, and. Uh, in addition to that, everything that we've learned up to this point, everything that was in that first unit, um, you know, if if you felt like uh, you didn't quite grasp things as well as you should have, or you didn't do quite as well on uh, quizzes or the exam, things are going to continue just to build. So there's going to be con there's going to be more and more opportunities to grasp the material that we've covered so far that we're going to use to build on uh, this, the content and subjects that we're going to talk about moving forward. In today's lecture, we're going to be focusing on G proteins and second messengers uh, within the context of cholera. Um, one of the most noteworthy cholera outbreaks uh, to date was one that happened in the early 20 19th century in Dudley, England, um, and it was uh, it was one it was an example of one outbreak that um, that was quite no that was quite noteworthy. Um, Cholera is particularly known as uh, as a disease that that causes severe diarrhea by a bacterium called Vibrio cholera. Uh, the fact that diarrhea is a blue term here is not that I am uh, am going to define it for you because I suspect everyone knows, but rather it's a blue term because it is so noteworthy uh, for cholera because of how much fluid loss occurs and the severity of the diarrhea that occurs. Um, with cholera, with a cholera infection. Uh, the toxin that's released by the bacteria is what causes this excess secretion of water uh, and this massive uh, water loss because of the severe diarrhea. And when we talk about severe, again, the severity is the key here. Um, when we talk about severe, we're talking losing about a liter of water per hour. And this is incredibly deadly and what happens is typically within out on the on the order of hours uh people who do not get treatment will die from cholera uh and it's typically transmitted via contaminated water sources and so one example uh one one really heartbreaking example is after the 2010 earthquake in haiti uh there was a really large cholera outbreak because uh a lot of major water sources were contaminated and as, as a result, uh, because of their infrastructure being uh, compromised as well because of the earthquake, the ability to handle the cholera outbreak uh, caused their in the inability to address it properly led to the cholera outbreak lasting a long time. Um, and so the, the key thing here to note is that it transmits because of contaminated water sources. It causes severe diarrhea that can cause death on the order of hours. Um, and because it's so deadly, unfortunately, some countries have weaponized it as uh, to, to create a cholera toxin in chemical and biological warfare. Uh, so again, it's an incredibly rap uh, a rapid, uh, rapidly active uh, agent that causes uh, death pretty quickly. A person can become hypotensive within an hour. Uh, does anyone want to define hypotensive or hypotension here? Yeah. Very low blood pressure. Yeah. Um, if you think about losing body, uh, losing body fluid that rapidly, um, you know, our blood plasma possesses a lot of things in it, but a major, a major part of it is water. And so if we're losing that much water, we're not going to be able to have enough fluid to actually perfuse our organs. And what's going to happen is it's going to cause a dramatic drop in blood pressure. And that dramatic drop, uh, if unaddressed, can lead to death within uh, a matter of hours. Um, as this disease progresses, this rapid loss of uh, uh, body fluid, this drop in blood pressure um, leads people to go into what we call hypovolemic shock. So shock as a broad category, like we we hear it as like anaphylactic shock. We hear septic shock. We're seeing hypovolemic shock. Uh, there's like different categories of shock, but like in general, going into shock means that your organs and your tissues are not getting enough blood perfused through them. So what ends up happening is your blood pressure dramatically drops. And as a compensatory mechanism, your heart rate skyrockets to try and get blood pumping through. Your body temperature will uh, drop dramatically, usually drop. Um, 
And so these are the, the hallmark signs of shock. And in this case, hypovolemic shock is because of a, a dramatic loss in body fluid here. And so the, the shock can last uh, over hours and then death follows fairly shortly after that. Uh, and this is uh, what, what this ultimately boils down to, this loss of body fluid is a form of severe dehydration that causes death. Uh, usually when uh, patients are given adequate fluids, when they're exposed to the cholera toxin, they'll usually make a full recovery. Uh, but because this can act so quickly, uh, uh, hydration is key. Uh, giving hydration quickly is also key. The reason why we're talking about cholera in the context of G proteins is because the cholera toxin itself is a G protein modifier. Uh, before we move forward, are there any questions? Yeah. So does, it, does um, infusing water replenish a lot of it to counteract the symptoms and feel like that? Great question. Uh, we're going to talk about that at the very end. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, better options than water. Are there any other questions? All right. So to quickly recap what was covered in the pre-lecture, um, G proteins are, G, oh, to, to, to make one specific uh, underlying part here, G proteins are, uh, a GTPA switch protein. So they are a GTP ace. They they're uh, they act on GTP and uh, will mediate hydrolyzing it to GDP. Um, in addition to that, G proteins are typically heterotrimeric, which means trimeric. They have three subunits. Hetero, they have a mixture of three different subunits usually. And so here we have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma subunits for a G protein. So that's kind of a um, a common feature across all G proteins, that they're GTPase and that they're heterotrimeric. What ends up happening is that when they're in an inactive state, they're associated next to what we call a G protein coupled receptor uh, or a GPCR. The nice thing is it kind of tells you what's happening here. It's a G protein coupled receptor. So this receptor is coupled with a G protein. When that receptor, engages with its ligand here we'll call we're going to call that ligand or factor x uh, a lot of gpcrs uh, bind to hormones or um, a lot of other uh, factors that can sometimes even be associated with smell or taste but when gpcrs bind to their ligand when one protein engages with another protein they each carry some sort of charge that charge will elicit a conformational change that conformational change in the gpcr will be distributed over to the G protein. What ends up happening is that the G protein here, the alpha subunit is the catalytics, uh, the catalytic site where there's actual engagement with uh, a G. The beta and gamma subunits, what ends up happening is that they associate with the GPCR. And so when that G protein coupled receptor has, when that G protein coupled receptor engages with its ligand and has a conformational change, that's passed over to the beta and gamma subunit. So there's an allosteric regulation there at the beta and gamma subunit end. So what happens is there's a conformational change here at the beta and gamma subunit, allosterically acting over here, okay? So when it's, it's inactive state, there's a GDP bound to the alpha subunit. When that conformational change happens in response to that ligand binding to the G protein coupled receptor, the, GD, the, the wiggle denotes the conformational change. What ends up happening is the alpha subunit will lose a GDP molecule and bind to its substrate, GTP. When GTP is bound to the alpha subunit, what ends up happening is that the alpha subunit will now undergo a conformational change because it's bound to its substrate here, and it will disassociate and go bind uh, to another molecule here that we call adenylocyclase. When the alpha subunit, and this is all happening along the membrane here, they're all tethered to the membrane, so it's sliding across there. Once the alpha subunit engages with adenylocyclase, uh, adenylocyclase will then be activated 
to uh, act on its substrate here. It's adenylylcyclase. So it's an enzyme that has a substrate that it acts on. Its substrate is ATP. So what ends up happening is ATP is modified to become, sorry, I'm gonna take a step back. ATP is, uh, is the substrate that adenylocyclase acts on and it cr uh, converts it into cyclic AMP. And so what ends up happening is it cycles through and creates many, many cyclic AMP molecules. So one adenylocyclase can create many uh, cyclic AMPs. And so, so uh, this what's important to, uh, the two key things I wanna take note of here is that when the alpha subunit bound to an ATP, it had an ADP originally, uh, but now it has an ATP on it. That's not a phosphorylation event. There's not a phosphate group added. It's an exchange, uh, similar to before, when, we, when we talk about nucleotide exchange factors for our cytoskeleton lecture. What ends up happening is the uh, after that activation, the ligand binds here and the allosteric regulation from the beta and gamma subunit, AD, uh, ADP, sorry, this is a G protein. I'm going to make sure I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm making a mistake, I'm gonna make it clear. So it's a G protein, so it binds to GTP. So it has a GDP, it loses the GDP and binds to a GTP. Once that happens, now the alpha subunit disassociates, acts on adenylocyclase. And adenylocyclase, uh, and an easy way to remember what's acting on what, uh, G proteins act on GTP, adenylocyclase, the A in front uh, denotes that it works on the adenosine, or not instead of guanyl. So we have uh, adenylocyclase acting on ATP to create cyclic AMP. So for these G protein lectures with second messengers, mm -hmm. it helps to just like take a second to make sure you're not uh, confusing the GTPs and the ATPs. Uh, it's easy, as I, did, as I did at the board, it's easy to confuse those. Um, so what's good to note is once that GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, now the alpha subunit slides back over and it's back in its, in its inactive state. Um, and again, for it to be activated, we'll, uh, there's going to be a GDP that's released and a GTP will, will bind again to denote its activation and allowing it to go back over to adenylocyclase and promote more cyclic AMP production. Uh, phosphodiesterase uh, is a key enzyme that will take cyclic AMP. So a lot of these... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of these cyclic AMPs, ADPs, GDPs, they're all uh, recycled. So these cyclic AMPs uh, are going to be recycled into AMP. And those AMPs can then be used uh, to create more ATP for, uh, for, fuel, for, for further uh, catalytic reactions. Um, yeah, we'll go through and chomp them all up and create... AMPs in their stead. So this is what the trimeric G proteins really look like. We have our alpha subunit in red, we have our beta subunit in green, and our uh, gamma subunit in blue. And what ends up happening is uh, in the, particularly in the alpha subunit, what we can see is when I, I'm gonna try and see if I can catch it right here. So, Right there in the alpha subunit is the uh, GTP binding pocket. And so it took a long time to try and characterize these, uh, these structures. This is what the G protein looks like with a G protein coupled receptor in gold. Uh, and what's important to note is the discovery of G proteins earned the Nobel back in the 70s. The, uh, the relationship between G proteins and second messengers uh, award was awarded another Nobel. And then defining this structure here uh, actually earned another Nobel prize. And so a lot of this, while uh, I'm speaking personally here, while sometimes it might not seem incredibly super fascinating to look at these structure and, uh, structures and to define these structures, they're incredibly important. And actually approximately from uh, a, qu a quick cursory search, Approximately 50% of uh, drugs on the market have some sort of, uh, are, are targeting in some sort of a way, uh, G protein coupled receptors. And so these are these have incredible importance, both pharmaceutically as well as uh, in a basic science 
um, a basic science context. So uh, in that previous slide, we, we showed how cyclic AMP is produced when adenylocyclase is activated by that alpha subunit of the G protein. I'm sure all of you are wondering, what's that cyclic AMP for? Uh, that cyclic AMP is used to turn on another enzyme called protein kinase A. And so that protein kinase A uh, has four subunits to it. It has two regulatory subunits and two catalytic subunits. The, what ends up happening is that cyclic AMP, excuse me, cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits of PKA or protein, or protein kinase A. So one PKA, because it has uh, two regulatory subunits, one PKA will bind to two cyclic AMPs. When it binds to those two cyclic AMPs, what ends up happening is that the two uh, catalytic domains will then disassociate uh, from the regulatory subunits, uh, and th that denotes an active or activated PKA. So again, PKA has two catalytic subunits and two regulatory subunits. Cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits, so two cyclic AMPs for one PKA. Once they bind to the regulatory subunits, uh, the catalytic subunit will disassociate. Uh, as you can imagine, the, the binding of cyclic AMP will create a, some sort of conformational change to PKA, and that conformational change enables it to disassociate, uh, letting the, enabling the catalytic subunits to go and target their, uh, their substrate. What's important to note is that cyclic AMP is not the only uh, second messenger here. Um, there are two other mechanisms that, that we can look at that cause smooth muscle cell, uh, smooth muscles to either contract or relax. Uh, and one example that we've already covered is calcium. Um, cal so typically these second messengers work between, uh, work across proteins in some sort of signaling pathway to create some sort of outcome to occur, some sort of biological response. And so in smooth muscle, uh, we talked about how that calcium enables the, a regulatory light chain to be phosphorylated. There's a kinase that's regulated by calcium. And so that, that calcium works as a second messenger here. Uh, a couple other second messengers that are important to know that actually might sound a little familiar. Um, we talked about before during our phospholipid lecture that phospholipids all have a fatty acid chain. They have a glycerol group a phosphate group, and then some sort of alcohol. One of those alcohols could be inositol. Um, here we have uh, phosphoinositol by phosphate here, we call, or which we call PIP2. There's an enzyme called phospholipase C. Does anyone want to venture a guess what phospholipase acts on based on the name alone and knowing nothing else? Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, phospholipases are enzymes that act on and cleave phospholipids. And so when that happens, we, uh, we have our fatty acid chain uh, with our glycerol group. That's called DAG or diacyl, diacyl glycerol. And down below, we have inositol triphosphate. Um, and so the phosphate group along with the inositol uh, creates this uh, inositol triphosphate or IP3. So two second messengers that we get from one phospholipid that's normally in our plasma membrane is DAG and IP3. And those second messengers are going to become key uh, when we look at smooth muscle cell contraction or relaxation. Before I jump ahead to uh, what that, how, how these second messengers are used in contraction or relaxation, are there any questions? Or I'll stop and say, I'll pause for two questions. And I'll give you guys time to percolate for a question or two. Yes. Um, so is the phospholipid, I guess, activated by No, so uh, that's a great question. So the, the calcium that we were talking about before, um, sorry, let me, take a, let, me, let me take a step back. When I was talking about calcium, I was describing how calcium is a second messenger. And uh, I was referencing how we discussed calcium regulates a kinase, and kinase are enzymes that phosphorylate. Uh, there's a, a kinase that phosphorylates the regulatory light chain on myosin and smooth muscle cells. And so like that is, so, so calcium is a second messenger 
in that context. Um, phospholipase C, off the top of my head, I don't know what activates it. But typically when there's a C there, like there might be a relationship with calcium. So you might be right, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but the key thing to note here is that the phospholipid in our plasma membrane, phosphonesetol, uh, is one of the substrates for phospholipase C. And so it can cleave it to create diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate or DAG and uh, IP3. And those two molecules are second messengers that we're gonna discuss about in a moment. That was a good question. And I actually wish I looked it up earlier. So that was gonna be bugging me a little bit. Yes, go ahead. That so uh, there's a change that occurs prior to the uh, prior to the sliding, um, when the ligand binds to the G protein coupled receptor. Uh, you know, I, I tried to like there's like wiggling and shaking that tried to denote conformational change, but basically, so ligand binds to the receptor that induces a conformational change there on the G protein coupled receptor, but the G protein is coupled with it, and so like conformational changes that happen here that expose new, maybe. Uh, amino acids that were embedded that are now like available, that's gonna change the conformation of the G protein. So now that's gonna induce um, GDP to be released and GTP to bind, and that's gonna induce like some change. And now, now that cha those changes are gonna be coming together to enable the alpha subunit to leave and go bind to adenylate cyclase. And, there's, and this is, what I should say is, uh, and I, I didn't say this earlier, so I'm glad you asked about this. Um, that is just kind of like a characteristic of G proteins. There are, there are different kinds of G proteins. It's not like, uh, it's like enzymes. Like there are different kinds of enzymes, but not, of them all, not all of them are like exactly the same. The same is true with G, G proteins. They might act on something different. Um, it might not always be adenylocyclase, but like this is like one like general rule of thumb for G proteins that they, they typically will. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate you asking that question. Yes. Uh, what it's doing is, so it's basically cutting off a piece of that phospholipid. So like the, the fatty acid chain is still embedded in the plasma membrane. The glycerol group is still here, okay? But what it's done is that the polar head where we have phosphate in the alcohol is now clipped and is now released into the cyto cytoplasm and is now going to be used as a second messenger. But also, this, uh, this, uh, these, uh, these two fatty acid chains with the glycerol group, you're like, this is also a second messenger. It's staying right here because, again, the fatty acid uh, chain is still embedded in the plasma membrane. Um, and the uh, phosphate and the alcohol group here, which is IP3, that's, enabled, that's freed up by the enzyme's activity and able to now be a second messenger throughout the cytoplasm. Does that make sense? So this is still here. This is still here. Just kind of basically went through and just like, like a machete, just cut it in half. And each of these now are still going to be biologically active. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that. So hold that thought. All right. So uh, smooth muscle cell contraction and relaxation is important, and it's a tightly regulated um, tightly regulated mechanism. And we're first gonna look at contraction and we're gonna look at the second messengers uh, that are a part of regulating uh, or part of promoting smooth muscle cell contraction. Uh, so one G protein coupled receptor uh, that one key ligand for G protein coupled receptors in, in smooth muscle cells is angioten angiotensin II. Uh, that is a hormone that can promote the increase in blood pressure. And so when it binds to its G protein coupled receptor, that'll induce a conformational change. That conformational change will be um, transmitted to the G protein at the beta and gamma, gamma subunit. And so there's allosteric regulation there. So now the alpha subunit will release GDP, bind to GTP, and now it, the alpha subunit will leave and bind uh, over here to uh, phospholipase C. So what's gonna end up happening is 
now that phospholipase C is activated, it's going to go through and it's going to clip PIP2 into those two other components of DAG and IP3. So before, like I said, DAG is going to stay there in the cell membrane, but IP3 is now going to uh, freely be available within the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, IP3, its next job is what it's going to happen is it's going to go down over towards uh, SCR, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And we talked about before how that's this uh, uh, one function of it is a, a reservoir or a storage site of calcium. So what's going to end up happening is it's going to promote the release of calcium from the smooth ER. And this release of calcium is going to be available to promote uh, the indirectly promote the phosphorylation on the regulatory light chain of myosin and promote contraction in smooth muscle cells. So this is how we get short-term contractility in smooth muscle cells. IP3 will bind to an IP3 receptor on the membrane of the smooth ER, and that'll open up a calcium uh, channel to promote the release of calcium into the cytoplasm that is then used for uh, re the regulatory light channel myosin to become phosphorylated, uh, and promote con contraction. Now, if we just left this, if we just left it like this, that'd be problematic. We need a way to turn this off and to regulate this contractility so that it's not long-term contractility. So one of the ways in which we do that is there's a, a key protein, protein kinase C, that uh, that is required for this regulation, but it requires, we can think of it as a two-factor authorization. It requires two things for it to become activated. So first, it requires uh, to, to bind to DAG at the plasma membrane. And next, it also needs to bind to calcium molecules. Once it reaches a certain concentration, there's a point at which uh, it's high enough where PKC will bind to calcium. Once PKC is bound to both DAG and calcium, now it's activated. And what's going to end up happening is that PKC... Uh, will alter many pumps and enzymes. So now it's just gonna be kind of like a generalization here uh, from what you need to know, but generally what will end up happening is that active PKC will go on and turn off pumps and turn off enzymes to shut down calcium transport out of the SCR and it'll inhibit long-term contractility here, okay? And so to recap all of this, so the GPCR activates the G protein, uh, which activates PLC, uh, phospholipase C, the PLC here. Phospholipase C will go through and cleave PIP2 into DAG and IP3. IP3 has a receptor, there's a receptor for it on the SER. IP3 will bind to its receptor and that will prompt the release of calcium from the smooth ER into the cytoplasm. So, that that release of calcium is important. I'm going to take one step back. That release of calcium is important for contraction. So up to this point, this is how we get contraction of smooth muscle cells, which is important for regulating vascular tone and regulating blood pressure. To shut down or turn off uh, this calcium release and turn off this contraction, what ends up needing to happen is uh, PKC will require two-factor authorization. It will require uh, binding to DAG, on the, on the plasma membrane, and it'll require binding to calcium once that concentration of calcium gets high enough within, within the cytoplasm. Once PKC is active, uh, it'll, activate, it'll, it'll, it'll activate pumps that are shuttling calcium back into the smooth ER uh, to restore, vas to, re to promote, uh, to inhibit long-term contractility of that smooth muscle cell. And this goes back to a question I got earlier. What ends up happening after that to help uh, to help restore things back, DAG will then be phosphorylated by a kinase to yield phosphatidic acid. And so then it'll be prepared as, it'll be available as a precursor for, to create a new phospholipid in the plasma membrane. I'm gonna stop there and give space for a couple questions. Yes. Can you repeat can you repeat that again? I just can hear everything. Is this proteinic deprotein active protein? No, different G protein. So I, I tried to reference this really quickly, but uh, not all G proteins are exactly the same. So this G protein 
that that's in this working in this system um, that activates we'll see is not the same as the one that uh, will activate uh, uh, adenylocyclase. So these are different G proteins. Yes. They are, uh, they're different because they are not the, uh, the whole, th the whole G protein together is considered GTPase, but the alpha subunit, you can consider that as like the, um, the active domain or the catalytic domain where it actually binds to the substrate. Yes. So, no. Mm -hmm. I suspect it's recycled to create subsequent phosphatidylinositols, subsequent phospholipids. And so what ends up happening probably is that the phos uh, phosphate groups are, uh, you know, we, we talk about phosphorylation, we talk about phosphatases that remove phosphate groups. And so what is what is likely gonna happen is that that inositol group is gonna be recycled as an alcohol to create a new phospholipid. Perhaps not, perhaps not on the same exact one that we were just using, perhaps on a totally different one, because there's phospholipids constantly being used for different mechanisms. This is one mechanism in which we use our phospholipids, um, but uh, they're really uh, bioactive lipids uh, that will, be clipped like this and uh, will require new alcohol groups to come in to replace it for new phospholipids. Yes. So because the phospholipids oxidase and can that affect the integrity of the membrane? Great question. So the, um, so the phosphate group is charged and it's not wedged in the membrane. And so because we still have the because we still have the glycerol there with those uh, particularly in this case with its diacylglycerol, so it has two fatty acid chains, um, that's not going to change the degree of kinking. Um, so like there's still that fluidity necessary within the plasma membrane for that 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 phospholipid provides. Um, and it's still stable there. And so what it's going to end up happening is that there's going to be um, like there's going to be DAG kinase that adds a phosphate group. And there's going to be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, new alcohols brought in. And so it's not going to change the structural integrity. Uh, what will end up happening is it'll change the bioactivity. So like we talked before about how phosphatidylserine uh, is really important as an interleaflet phospholipid. And so like there's, there's just going to be new uh, bioactivity or new roles based on that alcohol group that's added. It's not going to change the integrity at that location. Yes. Oh, uh, you're saying, uh, you're asking, does the uh, PKC leave from DAG? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that yes, that's the very, yes, that's true. Did your hand go up a moment ago? Uh, um, how does PKC, like, like, signal the um, calcium catalytic cell, or does it have to punch the cell? Yeah, so that's, uh, so typically for proteins like PKC, there's kind of like a cascade of events that happen. Uh, and so like within that cascade, one of the consequences of that cascade of events is to phosphorylate a um, calcium channel. And so like sometimes channels will have directionality, like they're gonna be direction to like pump an ion this way or to pump an ion this way. So like if this direction is like into the smooth ER, there are calcium pumps that are activated uh, by the PKC pathway that'll prompt it to shuttle calcium back into the smooth ER. Because typically like we don't have, like typically the calcium concentrations by location are tightly regulated. And so this is one way in which it's taken out of the cytoplasm and thrown back into the smooth ER. Yeah. All right, so that was contraction and how it's activated and um, inhibited to ensure that's not long-term contractility. We're gonna take a moment to look at relaxation of smooth muscle cells to ensure that uh, you know we have multiple, because this is an important pathway, multiple ways of regulating um, that contraction ensuring relaxation. So we have our uh, influx of extracellular, the first event is we have an influx of extracellular 
calcium ions into this uh, cytoplasm. Um, another key molecule here is nitric oxide. I'm gonna turn that off for a second because that's distracting. Um, there's a key molecule here, uh, nitric oxide. It's uh, a really critical vasodilator that is because it's a gas and it's uh, created by um, these enzymes called nitric oxide synthase. Uh, and nitric oxide synthase, you may have heard of them. They come in a few different species. Um, we have inducible INOS, endothelial INOS. And so in this case, uh, because we're in a vasculature environment, this is going to be typically endothelial nitric oxide synthase. But again, the key thing is uh, nitric oxide synthase is an enzyme that promotes the production of nitric oxide. And so nitric oxide, it's a gas. It can diffuse across the membrane, and it'll actually bind to guanylyl cyclase. Um, and so guanylyl cyclase, similar to adenylyl cyclase, what it'll do is it'll take GTP and make cyclic GMP. Um, sorry, I just need to turn it off and turn it back on. So again, guanylyl cyclase, it's, sub, it's an enzyme and its substrate is GTP and it, it creates uh, or synthesizes cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP will then bind to uh, PKG, PKG and create a cyclic GMP PKG complex. Um, that will then go ahead and be able to uh, shut off calcium transport into the cell. So in phosphorylase that channel, let's turn it off there. I'll wait a second for the monitor to come back on. Thanks for waving me down. Okay, so I'll take a step back. So uh, nitric oxide, it's a gas, so it can diffuse, ac uh, a few, diffuse across the membrane here. It'll bind and activate guanylyl cyclase. When guanylyl cyclase is activated by nitric oxide, what ends up happening is that its substrate is GTP, and much like adenylyl cyclase, it'll turn GTP into cyclic GMP. Um, and now PK uh, protein kinase G, uh, it'll it'll form a complex with cyclic GMP, and those two together will now be able to shut off that transporter of calcium. Uh, and not only that, but it'll also go on and turn uh, activate a transporter that moves calcium into the smooth ER. So PK, uh, the complex of PKG with cyclic GMP, it does two things here. It shuts off calcium being shuttled into the cytoplasm and it takes calcium in the cytoplasm and shuttles it through that transporter that, ph that ph it phosphorylates. Again, it's a protein kinase. So it's a kinase that phosphorylates. It phosphorylates that transporter to stop tr calcium from coming in and it phosphorylates that one to turn it on and to shuttle calcium into the smooth ER. So just quickly recap, just to make sure uh, the, the big picture is, uh, the big picture uh, gets, the we get the take home message from the big picture. Nit nitric oxide is a gas and it can diffuse across the membrane here. It's created by nit nitric oxide synthase. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Um, and it diffuses to its target guanylyl cyclase and, uh, act and activates it. <clears throat> it's uh, it's an, uh, a guanylyl cyclase agonist. We have antagonists that turn things off and agonists that, for lack of a better phrase, turn things on. And so nitric oxide is a guanylyl cyclase agonist. And guanylyl cyclase, well, it's uh, an enzyme that binds to GTP and it'll turn it into cyclic GMP. That will activate protein kinase G. So when protein kinase G is activated, now it can really go uh, move forward and stop, uh, stop the contraction or promote relaxation in smooth muscle cells. So PKG, protein kinase G, it, it's a kinase that phosphorylates. It'll phosphorylate uh, and turn off the transporter shuttling calcium into the cytoplasm. Uh, and it'll activate the transporter shuttling calcium back into the smooth ER. And similarly as before with uh, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP can become uh, just GMP uh, via phosphodiesterase. And so, the to try and make sure that we're maintaining the big picture here, and uh, and oftentimes the reason why I keep talking about the big picture is that there's so many details that we talk about in this class, and it can be really hard uh, 
it can be really hard to get a sense of how the pieces fit together. But usually if you can keep a sense or maintain a sense of what the big picture is, filling in the details and holding them together becomes a little bit easier. And so the big picture here is that we have G protein coupled receptors and that are coupled G proteins. Uh, and what ends up happening is that they promote the synthesis or the production of these secondary messengers um, like DAG or IP3 that help carry out specific functions. The two functions that we're focusing on here uh, is uh, uh, vascular smooth muscle cells either contracting or their relaxation. And really there's two main pathways that we focus on here. We have our one pathway that promotes contraction uh, where we look at uh, the, the phospholipase C being activated, we get DAG and IP3 that then releases calcium into the cytoplasm and we can get contraction. And we also have this pathway where we get ultimately activation of PKG that shuttles calcium back into the smooth ER and promotes relaxation. And so try and start with the big picture and then slowly fill in the details to where you can keep holding on to a sense of what the story is uh, and and not, not get bogged down in the details. Um, so what does all of this have to do with cholera? So in our intestinal epithelium, uh, those, those, epithelium uh, those intestinal epithelium are also called enterocytes. What ends up happening is we have a uh, hormone called the vasoactive intestinal peptide that binds to a G protein coupled receptor. Once that happens, we have the alpha subunit of the G protein that then disassociates and uh, after it binds to GTP, we'll uh, move over and activate denylocyclase. We get cyclic AMP production as a result of that. That will activate PKA. Now PKA, what it'll typically do is it'll activate uh, a specific chlorine ion, uh, uh, chlorine transporter uh, that is called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane uh, conductance regulator. You can just call it CFTR. Um, the reason why it has that name is that this particular ion transporter uh, is what is where a single mutation occurs that promotes cystic fibrosis. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about there are monogenic diseases that have a single mutation. And one example we talked about sickle cell disease. Um, and for some of you, uh, you, some of you have gotten feedback on your projects where you have uh, a polygenic disease that you're focusing on that has lots of diseases, uh, lots of genes associated with it. Because cystic fibrosis is a monogenic disease. It has one specific mutation on the CFTR gene that alters its function. Um, but the CFT, but despite the name being associated with cystic fibrosis, this ion transporter is a normal part of biology that's required, that we need. It's when it functions incorrectly that cystic fibrosis occurs. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to take a sip of water. I feel my throat getting scratchy. So what ends up happening in the intestinal epithelium, once, this, once CFTR is activated by PKA, we'll start to get uh, chlorine ions to be shuttled uh, out of the enterocyte into the uh, intestinal uh, lumen. Typically, uh, as just like a general rule of thumb, uh, and I'm sure those of you who have already taken physiology will know this, typically where... Uh, uh, where a chlorine ion travels across, sodium will, will uh, follow suit. And what ends up happening is that there's enough of an osmotic pressure that occurs as the movement of sodium uh, occurs that a wa water ions, water molecules will want to follow along and go into the intestinal lumen. And so this is how we get the movement of water into our intestinal lumen. But then this needs to be tightly regulated. And so what ends up happening is, forgive me, uh, this needs to be able to be turned off so that water is not um, being pumped across our intestinal epithelium and losing water. So in cholera, what ends up happening is that the cholera toxin uh, promotes a modification on the alpha subunit of the G protein. That modification is uh, an ADP ribosylation uh, where it, um, where, where it activates adenylocyclase. And so the consequence of this modification of this ADP ribosylation is that uh, the alpha subunit can no longer hydrolyze GTP to GDP. Now, does anyone want to venture a guess of what the consequence is of uh, the alpha subunit not being able to hydrolyze GTP to GDP? 
Yes. The, the, sorry, maybe you just said it. The, I thought the, the alpha subunit would stay active. It would stay active. It, it's exactly right. Yes. And so taking this to the example we just gave um, of these intestinal epithelium with the CFTR transporter, if, if this alpha subunit stays active, it'll continue to promote uh, active adenylocyclase, which will create more cyclic AMP, which will activate PKA, which will keep activating the CFTR transporter, and which will promote more and more chlorine ions to be shuttled across into the intestinal lumen, which will then, sodium will follow, and again, water will follow. And so this ADP ribosylation, uh, it's just an ADP with a ribose sugar on there that affects um, the ability for GTP to be hydrolyzed. Um, that small modification promotes rapid changes in our ability uh, to regulate water movement. And so this is just shuttling water into our intestinal lumen. Again, uh, the approximate rate is losing one liter of water an hour. And so the key thing to take home is that the cholera toxin, the way that it acts is it modifies our alpha subunit of our G proteins in our intestinal epithelium by promoting ADP ribosylation on the alpha subunit of, of the G protein there. The treatment, uh, hydration. Hydration is key. Um, getting IV fluids is the best option, um, but typically, um, typically uh, this happens in localities where there's contaminated water sources. And so as with the example that I gave in 2010 with Haiti, after that massive earthquake, a lot of infrastructure was compromised. And so that's an, that's an instance where it's really hard to get uh, lots of IV fluids available to many people. And so what ends up happening is in instances where uh, a cholera outbreak occurs, the best option is typically not IV fluids because of just um, because of the obstacles and hurdles, uh, but rather trying to create other uh, remedies for dehydration. And so the WHO basically created a, an easy recipe to try and create a um, a easily available hydration solution. Um, so typically in your intestinal uh, in our intestinal epithelium. Um, and trying to get water, we get, we're getting water shuttled out because of that CFTR uh, transporter. We wanna get water back into our body. And so this concoction leverages a sodium glucose uh, co-transporter on our epithelium. And again, where sodium typically goes, uh, you can just think water follows through with, follows along with it. Uh, and so we, they, uh, they leverage the, uh, this dynamic to create that uh, hydration solution that promotes the uptake of sodium and glucose uh, together. This is also pretty much what Gatorade is. Gatorade is a solution of water, salt, and sugar with a bunch of other stuff in there to make it taste better because this really doesn't taste very good. Uh, you all can make that if you'd like, but uh, it's not gonna taste very good. Gatorade tastes better. Um, but the key take home is that uh, this, this solution that WHO uh, put together leverages the movement, the osmotic pressure that drives water across that follows sodium uh, and leverages a sodium glucose transporter that is key for hydration in cases where dehydration is um, a, uh, can be fatal. If uh, this lecture on infectious disease uh, should have been infectious, not infection, uh, infectious disease uh, fascinated you, uh, UVA has actually a couple great resources, uh, a couple, not resources, a couple of great centers on infectious disease. Um, Bill Petrie is a world leading infectious disease physician. Um, he has been um, for Toxoplasma gandhi for, uh, there's one other infectious disease I'm trying to think of, but also for COVID. He has been at the leading edge for a lot of important work. Um, Allison Chris is also another member of the immunology group, uh, immunology center here that leads the, I'll make sure I get this right, uh, the GIDI here at UVA. Uh, and finally, uh, Brian Bryson is a professor at MIT that does a lot of uh, systems biology around infectious disease and does 
some of the coolest work out there, I think, um, as it relates to infectious disease. And so if any of this stuff interests you, I, uh, I recommend you check out their work. Um, before I wrap anything up, are there any questions? Yes, Darius. Um, so if you were to drink that sort of thing, you would want to you just run to the bathroom a lot more frequently. That's all. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. I appreciate you asking that. I should have said that. Yes, it is. Uh, fitting it, it is going through the tight junction between the epithelium. Uh, there's it's it's not going through the plasma membrane, so it's fitting through the tight junction, and it's uh, being driven out by osmotic pressure following sodium out of into the intestinal lumen. Thank you very much for asking that. I should have said that. Yes. Oh, two slides forward. Oh yes. Yes. Oh, that's also tight junction. This needs to just be slid down. Yeah, 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 here you go. Yes. So the reason this works is because it's not uptaking the sodium. That pulls the water with it. Yeah, there's an osmotic pressure that drives water across uh, and back into um, back into our bloodstream. But it's a higher concentration of sodium in the stomach. Why doesn't that pull water out? I mean, that's why we don't drink salt water. No, so there's uh, there's not a higher concentration in the lumen. So what ends up happening is we consume, we're consuming something with sodium and glucose. So this transporter is gonna move both sodium and glucose out of the lumen into our vasculature. And so because of that, that's gonna drive water to go along with it. So like a general rule of thumb is water will follow sodium when you, when you look at like ion transport in the body. So we have a lower concentration of sodium that we get compared to what already exists within the epithelial cell. We're just helping it buffer the amount of sodium. So, so let me jump in. We're we're ingesting a sodium and glucose rich solution. So in our uh, in our small intestine, there's going to be a, a bolus pretty quickly of sodium and glucose. Um, this transporter will take that sodium and glucose and start transporting it out of the lumen. That movement will drive water to follow the sodium along with it. Okay. So nothing... Is there a high concentration of sodium in lumen after we drink this? Yes, but acutely. What will end up happening is out over time, that concentration will go down because this transport is working to shuttle it out of the lumen and into your bloodstream. Yes. Not exchanger, co-transporter. Yeah, so that is a key transporter within our, within our intestinal epithelium. And so um, that, that, that's just one of, the, that's one of the transporters that's present on our enterocytes and on our intestinal epithelium. And so it's uh, when there's sodium and glucose both available together, it'll move them across out of the lumen. Oh, sorry, I, uh, my bad, I thought you were talking about this right here. You're saying, why is this here? I stole this slide from someone, I didn't put that there, so you can ignore that. Are there any other questions? All right. With that, uh, that concludes our lecture. Thank you for your time.